I'm Pastor Paul Baglios. And I'm Deacon Kim Hensman. On behalf of the people of Evangelical Lutheran Church in Frederick, Maryland, we welcome you to worship. We're delighted that you're with us. If this is your first time, or if you've been worshiping online with us for a while, we would love to connect with you. We invite you to scan the QR code on your screen to access an online form where you can provide your name and contact information. One of us will reach out to you. You're welcome to participate in all the activities of ELC, even if you're not located in Frederick, Maryland. To learn more, please visit our website at www.twinspires.org or go to our Facebook page at ELC Frederick. You can call the church office with prayer or pastoral needs at 301-663-6361. Welcome to worship. You are a beloved child of God. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. <laughs> Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Thank you. 
Let us pray together. Generous God, your Son gave his life that we might come to peace with you. Give us a share of your Spirit, and in all we do, empower us to bear the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Psalm 19, verse 7 through 14. <clears throat> The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. A reading from the book of James. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us and he prayed fervently that it may not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly, I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Over all the years since my ordination, I have on many occasions asked people whether they have a favorite passage of Scripture. I've always asked that question when working with people to prepare for a wedding or a funeral. I've often asked that question when interviewing candidates for rostered ministry in the ELCA. Sometimes I've asked that question in situations of pastoral counseling or teaching. Not once in all the times I've asked that question has anyone ever told me that their favorite passage of Scripture is the one where Jesus talks about tearing out your eyes and cutting off your hands and feet. That, however, is the passage before us today from the ninth chapter of Mark. I don't know anyone who loves this passage. In fact, if someone were to tell me that this is their favorite passage of Scripture, I would wonder about their mental and spiritual health. This is, to say the least, an unsettling and off-putting passage. Jesus' words here are shocking, and instinctively we recoil from hearing them. The temptation for many preachers, including this one, is to try to interpret what Jesus says so as to tone down the shock of his words and make them more palatable. Some preachers, perhaps, might be tempted in the opposite direction. They might want to ramp up the shock of Jesus' words as an excuse to terrorize or tyrannize their hearers. Regarding such preachers, I wonder about their mental and spiritual health. I don't believe Jesus' words require any added effort to ramp up their shock level. They are shocking enough just as they are in the ninth chapter of Mark. Neither do I believe that it's helpful or faithful 
to try to twist Jesus' words into something more palatable. What Jesus says about cutting off one's hands or feet or tearing out one's eyes is shocking and unsettling, and there's no way to avoid or evade our instinctive recoil. So what should we do with a passage like this? What should we make of the shocking and unsettling things that we hear today coming from the mouth of Jesus? As with all matters related to Scripture, we must give careful attention to the context of what we hear and what we read. Martin Luther, along with a great many other teachers of the Christian faith, reminds us that Scripture always interprets Scripture. If we disconnect any particular passage from the larger biblical context in which it occurs, we will likely lose our way in understanding. So let us give attention to the context in which Jesus says these shocking and unsettling things about cutting off or tearing out body parts. Everything depends upon our noticing the situation that introduces today's reading from the ninth chapter of Mark. John, who was one of Jesus' closest disciples, one within the inner circle of the twelve, said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. There it is. That's the issue. That's the situation. That's the context that sets the stage for everything else that follows in today's passage from the ninth chapter of Mark. An outsider, someone not following us, has somehow gotten involved in the ministry of Jesus, somehow found a connection to what Jesus is up to and what Jesus is all about. And we tried to stop him, says John, because he was not following us. In other words, he's not doing things our way. Jesus' response to John includes a series of crucially important statements well before he gets to those shocking statements about cutting off or tearing out body parts. Do not stop him, says Jesus. Do not put a stumbling block in front of anyone who is drawn to me, wherever and however that might occur, or whoever that might be. No one who does a deed of power in my name, says Jesus, will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. What Jesus is addressing here is the tendency of his followers, including all of us, to assume that our way of doing things is the only acceptable way. If we notice that someone is connecting to Jesus in a way that differs from how we connect to Jesus, then our tendency is to assume that they are doing it wrong. Because, of course, we always assume that we are doing it right. This is the reason why the whole Christian church on the face of the earth is chronically divided into so many different factions, different denominations, different traditions, and different teachings. There's nothing inherently wrong with all that diversity and variety. In fact, in many ways, it is vital and healthy. What is not healthy, however, 
is the tendency to regard diversity and variety as occasions of conflict and competition, reasons for animosity and hostility. Christians have certainly contributed their own share of religious strife and religious warfare to the history of the world. Why? Because they are not following us. This happens not only on a global scale, but in every local community and every congregation. Whenever someone who is not already part of us shows up, our antennae go on full alert over whether they will do things our way. Will they look like us? Will they act like us? Will they dress like us? Will they do church like us? When Jesus gets to those statements about cutting off limbs and tearing out eyes, he is telling us that if we must exercise our critical impulses and our judgmental tendencies, then we should do so turning away from others and focusing those tendencies upon ourselves. Because every single one of us has plenty to do for the rest of our lives, removing the stumbling blocks that get in our way of following Jesus. Rather than judging and critiquing others, we've all got plenty of work to do stripping away the things that cause us to stumble in our walk with Jesus. If it's your own hand, or your own foot, or your own eye that gets in your way, says Jesus, cut it off, tear it out. Jesus is not demanding self-mutilation as a requirement of discipleship. He is, however, calling us to continued growth and maturity in our Christian faith and our Christian living. Rather than assessing someone else as being somehow deficient in their faith or their living, we've all got plenty to do examining ourselves and our own lives. Therefore, says Jesus, let your saltiness do its good work within yourselves and be at peace with one another. Amen.
made children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. We pray for the church and its ministry. Bless the newly baptized and encourage them in their journey of faith. Sustain all members of the body of Christ in lives of prayer, service, and worship. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those in authority. Give them wise minds and compassionate hearts. Strengthen in them a desire to protect the vulnerable and care for those underserved. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are struggling with cancer, dementia, or any other disease. Provide them with peace and resilience for the days ahead. Sustain caregivers with energy and patience. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the worship leaders of this congregation, musicians, readers, volunteers, and staff. Bless us through their ministry and grant them the passion to continue in their service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for relief from the ravages of the coronavirus pandemic. Mend the broken hearts of those who have lost loved ones to this plague. Give healing to those who are infected. Protect those who are at risk. Sustain all medical workers in their labors and grant wisdom and understanding to all people so that we might become united in our resolve to overcome this scourge. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all and also with you. As we look around at a season in full bloom and gardens producing a beautiful harvest, we are reminded that just as ancient Christians were called to give their first fruits to God, we too are asked to graciously give back what was so abundantly first given to us by our God. During this season, we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit being sent to dwell among God's people. So with this gift, we remember the giving of ourselves, our time, and our possessions, our acts of joyous thanksgiving, lived out in response to the blessings that God sends to live and breathe within us each day. Let us give thanks with a joyous heart.
with you. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Lord, have your way with me. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Lord, have your way in me. O God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need, awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end, bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. Days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword. Still we are the voice in the desert crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, and the trumpet calls. Servant David rebuilding the temple of praise. And though these are days of the harvest, the fields are as white in the world. We are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, that trumpet calls. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Behold, He comes riding on the clouds. Shining like the sun, that trumpet call, lift your voice, it's here to believe, and that of Zion till salvation comes. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, that trumpet call, lift your voice, it's here to believe, and that of Zion till salvation comes. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds.
lives in Christ, rooted and built up in him, and abound in thanksgiving. May the blessing of the Holy Trinity, one God, be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen.